can you introduce living wills and their use in medical practice? So this is an advanced decision to refuse treatment, and that's the term used in English law. Lots of different terms are used across the world, advanced directives, living wills, and the like. And essentially, a document like this one is designed to enable me now to make decisions for a future in which I might not be able to make those decisions. And it's decisions specifically about medical treatment, and even more specifically about the treatment I want to refuse in the event that I can't at the time communicate what my wishes might be. So, for example, individuals might anticipate losing what the law calls mental capacity to make decisions for themselves about their health care in the future. And so what a document like this enables them to do is set down in advance what their wishes are, and particularly the treatment they don't want. So examples of treatment people might refuse include cardiopulmonary resuscitation, artificially provided nutrition and hydration, and so on and so forth. So there's a whole range of medical interventions, treatments, techniques that people might refuse for a future in which they lack capacity. Do living wills have any particularly interesting or surprising physical features? So what's striking about a document like this, attempting to set down in advance your wishes for future medical treatment, is you can actually set those wishes down verbally. You don't necessarily need a document at all, and that's certainly the case here in England and Wales in our legal system. Having said that, you'll notice that this example, provided by a charity that helps people to write advanced decisions to refuse treatment, this is just one example. It's quite a brief one. It's got two sides. You can tick, you can indicate your wishes. But theoretically, and we have seen this across the world, these documents can be very long indeed. So what strikes me is, as an object, it might well be a physical object, a piece of paper, but in the modern world, of course, we see certain jurisdictions are moving to online versions of these, apps and the like. But at the same time, it need not be a physical object. It might be just words expressed orally to someone who receives that information and acts on it in the future. Can you tell us how living wills were developed? So advanced directives, or as they were originally called living wills, were first developed, or proposed rather, in the late 1960s in America by a US attorney, Louis Cutler. And he had observed a close friend dying, receiving various high-tech medical interventions, and he thought it would be useful for people to have a mechanism, a means by which they could express their wishes about particularly what treatment they might not want to receive in the event that they lose capacity in the future. So from the late 1960s when this was proposed, it developed then, certainly in American law, various states enacted provisions to provide for people to make these statements in advance. And English law, where I'm currently speaking to you from, has followed that line. The judges initially here, certainly in the 1980s and 1990s, indicated that this was a good idea. And by 2005, we had an act of parliament setting down the circumstances and the criteria to meet in order to make a legally valid and indeed binding advanced decision to refuse treatment. The idea itself, though, we could trace it back much, much further. You could go back to ancient Greece, think of Homer and the Odyssey, and Odysseus famously being bound to the mast when he is travelling past the sirens, and he said to his crew, keep me bound no matter what I say during that moment of what the lawyers might call incapacity. So the idea has long been there, but as a legal instrument, we certainly see it from the late 1960s onwards across the world. Do living wills require practitioners to develop specific skills or competencies to use them effectively? So the practicalities behind a document like this, a so-called advanced directive or living will, will vary depending on the legal system you're in, the healthcare context you're in. Having said that, there are some features that we see quite often in lots of different places that have allowed in law people to make these advanced statements of their wishes. So, for example, for some very serious decisions, there might be a requirement that this time it must be in writing, perhaps it needs to be signed, perhaps it needs to be witnessed. There might even be requirements about dates being put on it for how long the document remains valid. So there are certain hoops to jump through, if you like, to ensure that this is a really valid document that applies to the situation that has now arisen. But for other decisions, perhaps not so important in terms of life or potentially death, perhaps it doesn't need to be a document. Perhaps verbal wishes alone will suffice. So it will always depend where we're looking in the world and at what time we're looking. In terms of making an advanced decision to refuse treatment or advanced directive, call it what you will, 
The person themselves will need what the law tends to call capacity or competence to make that decision now for a future in which they've lost capacity. But of course, if they're going to set down what their wishes about treatment and non-treatment are, they need to be helped to make the decision and know indeed what the options are. So for healthcare professionals dealing with patients or individuals who wish to make these sorts of statements, there are two or three skills or competencies that they require. First of all, of course, they need the relevant clinical information. What sort of treatment questions might face the patient in the future at the point that they can't answer them? Secondly, the healthcare professional will certainly need some communication skills to deal with that patient, to capture what the options are and what the patient's wishes and indeed values are so those can be documented if needs be. And thirdly, of course, because the person making the directive needs to have capacity at this point in time, then the healthcare professional may themselves sometimes need to assess whether the patient has capacity. Not in every case, but certainly in some cases. What do living wills tell us about medicine and medical ethics? What we see with a document like an advanced directive or advanced decision is a move to saying harm is actually something quite subjective. It's for individuals to interpret what counts as a harm or indeed a benefit to them. And nowadays we think that actually a core value to some people, the core value for medical ethics is that of respect for patient autonomy, for patient's ability to self-rule. And in a sense, the advanced directive is an expression of that. It's almost what some would say precedent autonomy. I am deciding now for the future. But this autonomy ethos is very much writ large in the move towards advanced decisions, advanced directives. It feels like it could potentially be a very strong signifier of the importance of listening to what patients want, or more importantly, don't want, in regards to medical treatment. And it's one clear legal landmark on the road to protecting this ethic of respect for patient autonomy, originating in the late 1960s, but finding legal expression across a variety of jurisdictions across the world. It's important because you can essentially see even a brief document like this two-page example operates as a shield, protecting the patient from unwanted intervention, even in a future where they've lost the ability to say yes or no. And that's striking because legally the signal is very loud, certainly from English law. So if you, the doctor, were to go ahead and treat in the face of a valid and applicable statement like this one, then you would be potentially guilty of a crime such as assault or battery, and potentially guilty of a civil wrong such as trespass to the person. So you're facing maybe a fine or maybe even imprisonment in the worst case, but it's a very strong signal that a document like this expresses the importance of this ethic of respect for autonomy. Mm -hmm.